and I think Mohammed's quite right to uh, remind us of the historic importance of the revolution that began in, in Tu Tunisia um, and important both because of its effects in the rest of the region but also because of the profound nature of the revolutionary process um, in, um, in Tunisia itself. And it's really fascinating listening to Mohammed because you get a sense of how the, the revolutions are influencing each other. You know, the, the, the storming of the state security headquarters in Cairo stimulates the at least formal dissolution of the state security organization in, in Tunisia. We really are talking about an international uh, revolutionary process. Now, um, it, of course, being on the same platform as Shishi, we think not just about Tafria Square, but in our provincial British way about Jeremy Paxman. Um, <laughs> And uh, Paxman clearly didn't learn the lesson that he got from Shishi because I was watching last night an interview that he did this week with Noam Chomsky. And um, Paxman says to, to Chomsky, what do you think of the Arab revolutions? And Chomsky says, they're wonderful. And Paxman is puzzled. He says, but these are, these are successes for Western democracy. And um, Chomsky, who incidentally later on talks about the difficulty of dealing with fools, um, <laughs> roars with laughter and says, these, these weren't pro-Western re revolutions, these were blows against pro, these, these represented rebellions against pro-Western regimes. Um, and indeed, of course, this is one of the most fundamental things to understand when we, people make comparisons, for example, with the revolutions in Eastern and Central Europe in 1989. I mean, those were great moments of liberation, but their effect in terms of the operation of the global system was by destroying state capitalism in the East to strengthen Western and particularly US imperialism. By contrast, what we're seeing happening, unfolding in the Arab world at the present, present time, and particularly in Egypt, because it's of its strategic importance, because of the way in which the peace treaty between Egypt and Israel in 1979 essentially liberated Israel to wage war in Lebanon and in, in Gaza and underpinned the whole system of pro-Western alliances in the, in, the, in the region. What we are seeing unfolding it, Sorry, I'm mixing me metaphors because you can't unfold a dagger. But nevertheless, what we're seeing happening is a dagger being driven towards the heart of U.S. imperialism in the Middle East. Because one of the key props to U.S. hegemony globally has been its domination of the Middle East. And that domination has rested not just on Israel, but on a system of alliances with highly dictatorial regimes. Egypt was one of the... Egypt since Sadat has been one of those key regimes, but of course Saudi Arabia under its uh, gerontocratic collective monarchy uh, is another very important example. And it's interesting that we see the ripples of revolution even affecting uh, Saudi Arabia itself. Now, of course, here in Britain, the, the character of the uh, relationship, which, if you like, the moral quality, of the relationship between British capitalism and the Arab dictatorships has been very clearly exposed with the scandals surrounding uh, the links. Um, it seems particularly with, really, with New Labour and their allies and hangers on and the Gaddafi regime. Um, the London School of Economics, one famous British university, has been thoroughly shamed by the affair, the, the good name of one of the leading Marxists in this country, Ralph Miliband, has been shamed by the fact that um, Saif Gaddafi was allowed to give a lecture, a, Ra a Ralph Miliband memorial lecture uh, at LSE. Can you imagine anything more despicable? This, this disgusting, um, privileged, pampered dictator's son uh, giving a lecture in the name of someone who fought for liberation and against capitalism and oppression and imperialism all, all his life. I should add that it's also shaming to discover that my own institution, King's College, um, had a centre, can you imagine it, an international centre for prison studies 
uh, which, uh, with the help of the Foreign Office, advised the Gaddafi regime on a prison reform. Uh, it's an absolutely disgusting business. And what it underlines is that when David Cameron and Nicolas Sarkozy talk about intervening in Libya, um, uh, setting up a no-fly zone, arms to the rebels and that sort of thing, they're not aiming to help those revolutions that are sweeping through the Arab world. They are doing that in order to try and reconstruct their system in the Middle East. And we have to say absolutely equivocally, hands off Libya, Britain, France, the United States, all the other Western powers, stay away from Libya. But there's a, a deeper reason why these revolutions represent a crisis for the whole capitalist system. Because if we look at Egypt and Tunisia, what we see are countries that were in the vanguard of neoliberalism in the, in the Middle East, that were held up by the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund and all the rest of them as exemplary. This was particularly true of Tunisia under Ben Ali. The World Bank couldn't contain its enthusiasm for what a splendid set of economic reforms that Ben Ali was implementing and, 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 and so on and so forth. But the Mubarak regime um, in Egypt also um, can claim to have been in the vanguard of neoliberalism. After all, uh, Infita, the policy of opening Egypt up to Western trade and investment, started in the mid-1970s under Sadat and was one of the first steps that he took towards locking Egypt into the Western-dominated system, system of uh, alliances. Now, if you look at what neoliberalism meant in the Arab world, there certainly weren't any great miracles. There was, I mean, Mubarak used to talk about creating a tiger on the Nile, that Egypt would become comparable to South Korea or Taiwan or China or somewhere, somewhere like that. That, that didn't, didn't happen, um, either in Egypt or, or in, in Tunisia. But what you see as a result of neoliberalism is a profound economic, social and political polarization, which is crucial to understanding the present revolutions. On the one hand, neoliberalism, neoliberalism means in the Middle East as elsewhere, growing poverty, unemployment, and more general material suffering for the, for the masses. The, the figures for youth unemployment throughout the region, including Saudi Arabia, I read the other day, youth unemployment in Saudi Arabia is 30% which is a typical figure for the, for, the, for the Middle East. In Egypt, under neoliberalism, by 2010, according to the International Labour Organization, 44% of the population were living under the, the international poverty line of um, two, two US dollars a day. So you have growing impoverishment for the masses, reinforced by things like the increasing food prices that have been a feature of the present global economic crisis. The global economic crisis more generally hitting these economies harder and because so many people are so poor in these societies anyway, the, the effects of the crisis are quadruple, uh, at least, uh, on ordinary people, the kind of effects that they have bad than they are in a country like Britain or the United States. So you have impoverishment at the bottom, and then at the top, you have the development of crony capitalism. A tiny minority of, in terms of these society, super rich, who batten on the, 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 the society and who are the main beneficiaries of the neoliberal restructuring of the economy. So, for example, in Egypt, you have this man called Ahmed Ez, who was a crony of Gamal Mubarak, uh, Mubarak's son, um, who was the kind of leader of the le neoliberal faction inside the Egyptian government, um, who was, uh, Ez was able to, um, to um, buy up a, a privatized steel company cheap. He ended up dominating two-thirds of the Egyptian steel market. He was also a leader in the ruling party, the NDP. When it, he, was, he was in charge of their election campaign last November, which was even by Egyptian standards, a very blatant example of thuggery and, and rigging and so on. In Tunisia, you have in particular the Trebelsis, the family of Ben Ali's wife, 
his in-laws, who amassed enormous wealth. I mean, Leila Trabelsi, Ben Ali's wife, is supposed to have included in her luggage when they fled to Jeddah 1.5 tons of gold bars. Uh, so you're talking about the crudest form of physical looting of a, of a country by these, these people. Now, I go on about this not just to illustrate what uh, Egypt and Tunisia are, because to be honest, you know, the ruling classes are bastards everywhere. Uh, they're not particularly any worse than our own bunch of, uh, well, I won't go on. Uh, but to highlight the effects of neoliberalism in these societies, which was that, that according to neoliberal ideology, one of the key things about a market society is that there's a sharp separation between economics and politics. Politics is restricted to the narrow do domain of elections and things, things like that. Economics is under the control of the market. It's governed by the impersonal logic of the market and never the twain are supposed to meet. That's the, the theory of neoliberalism. It, it doesn't correspond to reality here. But certainly, if we look at societies like Egypt and Tunisia, the reality was the opposite. What neoliberalism in these societies meant was the closer fusion of economic and political power. Not in the form of the old state capitalisms of the era of Nasser or Bukhiba and so on, but rather in the, in the, in the form of this tiny parasitic elite um, amassing into their hands the bulk of the wealth, the bulk of the, bulk of the economic assets in that, in that society. And, this, and, and able to do so because of their political links with the, uh, with the, ruling, with the ruling circles. Now, and the, what that meant, what, the effect of that, was to create uh, a target against which people could revolt against. And when they revolted, they were rebelling for both economic and political reasons. When Mohammed talks about how the, the rising in Tunisia started in um, poor provincial, provincial towns away from the capital Tunisia and gradually spread, uh, uh, sorry, away from Tunis and, and gradually spread to Tunis, Tunis, what we see is a revolt of the poor, but a revolt of the poor that rightly directs itself against the culprits, the, the, the political regime, Ben Ali and his and his cronies. Now, what the result is that we can now say very confidently, revolution is a 21st century reality. All the, if you're a student, all the blah 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 that you have to put up from academics about how revolution ended in 1989, revolution is, you know, a modern a phenomenon and we live in a postmodern world and, you know, revolts and you know, you get it on the left as well, Tony Negri and co, you know, revolts are decentralised, they don't have anything to do with the state, and so on. You can forget all that stuff. It always was bunk, and it's now being exposed as bunk. Look, look at what's happening in Libya. You see, in a way, the purest logic of revolution. When it comes down to it, who is going to be able to amass enough people and enough foul power to defeat the other side. Anyone who says that the state is irrelevant in revolutionary struggles today is kidding themselves and is giving the wrong advice to the people who are involved in these revolutionary struggles. Now, of course, <coughs> so far, what we're seeing are what are, to use a distinction drawn by Leon Trotsky, political, not social, revolutions. What they've done, what they've been able to achieve so far, <coughs> is to re remove particular rulers, but not to get rid of the regime over which they have presided, let alone to break uh, the hold of capitalism on the societies in question. And what we're seeing in the interim governments, the supreme command of the armed forces in, e in Egypt, the successive interim governments, <coughs> In, in Tunisia are attempts to restabilize the existing regime, to preserve the existing social system with the most limited and co cosmetic um, uh, political changes. So, you know, get rid of the old bad guys from the RCD and stuff a government full of, 
full of uh, full of investment bankers. That's great. You know, investment bankers have such a terrific record of <laughs> successful economic management over the past few years. <coughs> but there, there's a problem, and there's an interconnected problem, which is first is that the pressure that produced from below that produced the revolutions in the first place is pushing for real change in those societies is pushing in the first instance for getting rid of the regime. And Mohammed has described that very well in the case of Tunisia. <coughs> but you can see it also in Egypt. Those <coughs> fantastic scenes, if you haven't seen them on YouTube, you should go there and look at them. The scenes of when, um, the, when uh, campaigners had stormed, for example, the headquarters of the State Security Investigation Service uh, in NASA City, uh, in, no, I think it's, well, Gigi can say where it is, but it's close to Cairo, part of the greater Cairo combination, I think. Um, fantastic scenes where people are going through the security headquarters, uh, see, tr looking for documents. Uh, you see um, an is Islamist activist demonstrating how he had been tortured by the state security, and so on. These are classic examples of what happens in the early stage <coughs> of revolutions that overthrow dictatorships. Saliamento, they called it in Portugal in 1974, purging, cleansing the state of all the immense remnants of the old regime. The problem is, the second, however, the problem isn't just the self-mobilization of the masses and their demands for real change, but that once you start pressing for real change, it's very hard to separate economics and, and politics because of the whole character the whole political economy of these societies, because of how neoliberalism developed in, the, in these societies, if you start dismantling the old regime, you start cutting into the very structure of economic power in those societies. I mean, the Egyptian regime has arrested heirs and, um, and uh, they're also closing in a bit on the Mubarak family. But these are symbolic gestures that they want to make to appease the mass movement. The pressure from below will be for much more fundamental ch changes. And the pressure will continue, I think, because of the material condition of the masses in these, in these societies, because of the levels of poverty and unemployment, because also the effects of the revolutions are economically disruptive. Egypt and Tunisia are both heavily dependent upon tourism. That will also have its effects on people's material si situation. Because of the material pressure on people's lives, the demands for real improvements in their lives will, I think, if anything, go stronger. And when you finally add in the role of the workers' movement, which was a key feature in both those revolutions, the general union of, uh, of Tunisian workers mounting a general strike the day Ben Ali went, the few days before Mubarak uh, resigned, a strike wave beginning to sweep Egypt that helped to push the White House and the, the generals to, to get rid of Mubarak. And if we look at Egypt today, that strike wave continues. You're getting all sorts of other protests, people protesting over housing, over the price of butane gas, all sorts of immediate, immediate material, material questions. What we are seeing unfold is the logic of what Trotsky called permanent revolution. Trotsky argued that when you have great mass struggles that seek to achieve democratic changes, because of the kind of factors that I'm talking about, there's a tendency for these democratic revolutions, as he put it, to grow over into social, socialist revolutions. And we can see that logic unfolding in the, in, the, in the Middle East today. But it's one thing to say that a logic is at work, the, the crucial question is agency. Who is going to carry out the transformations that would make permanent revolution a reality in countries like Egypt and Tunisia. And that's partly a question of class, but it's also a question of politics. The agent of such changes has to have at its center the organized working class. And we can see that happening in both those countries, and maybe particularly in Egypt, with the, free, for example, the preliminary conference of a, a federation of independent Egyptian unions taking place over the last last few days. The working class has to emerge as an independent actor and it is beginning to do so. But independence isn't just a matter of organisation, it's also a matter of politics. 
And the idea that these are societies that are innocent of politics is nonsense. You have all sorts of ideologies. You have Islamism, which of course our rulers are terrified of in a ridiculous Islamophobic Islamic, uh, Islamophobic way. Islamism is itself highly heterogeneous politically. You have liberals, you have traditional Arab nationalists, the remnants of Nasserism in Egypt, for, for, for example. You have all sorts of different tendencies. And you have, very important in Egypt, you also have revolutionary socialism. Not just with a small R and a small S, but also with a big R and a big S. The revolutionary socialists are our comrades who were part of the 25th of January revolution that started in Tahrir Tahrir Square. If, if the working class is to be able to carry out its historic role of transforming democratic into socialist revolution in these societies, then we need to see the development of mass revolutionary parties in countries like Egypt and, and Tunisia. I, the conditions, I think, are beginning to emerge for that to, to happen. But it's, it's crucial to underline this point. Revolutions don't just happen. They're always organized. Gramsci said, anyone who says a struggle is spontaneous doesn't know enough about that struggle. There's always organization. There's always leadership of some sort. And this is clearly true in Egypt and Tunisia. For the revolutions to succeed, to carry through their full logic, there has to be conscious, class-rooted revolutionary organization in those countries. And I'll tell you, not just in, the, in those countries as, as well. We need, what we're seeing is a moment of profound crisis within the, the global crisis of capitalism that has unfolded over these past few years. What we've seen in the past few months, in all sorts of different forms, from our own student protests to the struggle in Wisconsin, is that crisis beginning to provoke mass political resistance. And if that mass resistance is finally to break the hold of capitalism, we need to build, or to support the building, not just of the revolutionary socialists in Egypt, but to build the Socialist Workers' Party in this country and revolutionary socialist organisations all over the world.